morning everybody good morning this is our pre-show drive so not quite the start of drive yet um, we are still parked outside the DRC we seem to be having some comms issues quickly with with our cameraman so Jandre is with me on camera we're just gonna try to sort that out well, he's not here at the moment he's off the vehicle um, so I'm alone anyway Brent is out already, he's going to be on the other vehicle this morning and then Steph's back this morning too, or a little bit later for the bush walk, which is nice. Um, what else? It's a cool overcast morning. The joys of dealing with our comms issues daily. Oh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> interesting but I suppose if you're out in the bush if you're out in the bush that's what happens I think Jandre is just getting another radio <laughs> Jandre is back it's tough when I'm by myself and I'm just going to speak to apps. well not no one I suppose I've got everybody watching or well, most people watching already Great go away birds. Um, shall we do a test there quickly, please, Jerry? Yes. Oh no. N nothing yet. Nothing yet. <laughs> yeah, me by myself. Still nothing, Jandre. No, we still seem to be having issues with our comms, unfortunately, for Jandre. Hi, Steph. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Jandre. Can you hear me? Yes, Jandre, Jandre, Jandre. Morning, Steph. Did you get that? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Do a quick test there, please, Jerry. Are we good? Okay, perfect. I think we sorted now with the um, with the comms issue. Yeah, it looks like. Chandra's camera checks have been done. Do I need to clap, Jerry? Don't I need to clap and? No, I didn't clap. I didn't clap. That was Brent. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, doing a, a a mic test and a sync test, so that you can all hear me. All right, let's go. We're ready, Jandre. Um, I think Brent's looking for lions this morning. I'm going to look for anything really. Uh, weather this morning 22 and 71, but I think Brent might tell you that again at the official start of the show. 22 degrees Celsius, nice and cool, not too bad. Not too hot. It was quite hot last night though. Um, very muggy. Hoping to get some rain and it's threatening. It's, it's cloud cover in the mornings and then what's been happening, cloud cover burns off and then uh, we get these um, rain threats. Uh, well, I say threatening rain. It looks like the clouds are building. It looks like it's going to rain. It's like it did yesterday. And then uh, then nothing, no rain. So hopefully it keeps building and perhaps soon we'll have some rain. Goodbye, everybody. Well, for now, for the pre-show show. <laughs> we'll see you all shortly. Brent's going to start the show. We'll chat to you later. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. 
Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to the middle of the African bush. We're on a fresh set of male lion tracks. Hopefully we find them soon. This is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. to the middle of the African bush. Oh, I'm attached at the ear. Now, there's two male lions walked past quarantine. They've come down into Philemon's dip. We're going to try to figure out where they've gone from there. We've lost the tracks. And sometimes they cut through towards the old hyena den. So I'm just having a quick look for some fresh tracks here. Hopefully the bushes don't growl at me. Now, we are 100% live from the middle of the African bush. You can also ask us questions by using the hashtag SafariLive or the email address question at wildearth.tv. Now, it doesn't look like the lions went this way, so we're going to go down and check where the last tracks went. Now, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a warm morning. As you can see, I'm still in my short pants. It's about 22 degrees Celsius, 72 Fahrenheit, uh, but it is a quite overcast and cloudy. But I don't think it's going to rain just yet. It's been threatening, and according to the weather forecast, which I don't ever trust, um, we're supposed to have an absolute deluge come oh, Thursday, or oh no, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, there is 120 millimeters predicted. If that's the case, we shall not be going on game drives. We shall be going on game swims. Might have to do some serious frogging. B. Wilson, welcome, welcome. B. Wilson's wondering if it rained last night. It did not. And uh, I think it's building, building, building. We will see if the South African weather services have got it right. They've issued flood warnings for the weekend. And uh, as I said, we, we might be freestyling through the African bush uh, or batten down the hatches and stay in the tent. We're going to have to see what happens. Uh, I never know with weather. It's one of those ones. I'll tell you when it's raining, when it's raining. So the last tracks were in this little dip here, which is known as Philemon's Dip. It's also the, the water pump that puts water in our showers. Okay, I'm just gonna have a quick look. Now, we definitely had tracks just up ahead. Now, did they disappear into the bush and follow the drainage line, or did they cut through to the west? So there were at least two of them from the track I could see. I wonder if they went down this little sneaky road here. Okay, I'm a lion. Where am I going to go next? I'm going to stop over here. Yes, I'm going to stop over here. I'm going to set mark quickly. I'm going to keep going because I'm the biggest, toughest cat in the bush. And uh, where do I go from here? I know, I'm going to confuse Brent and I'm going to go this way. Or not. Or do I? Now, quite often when you're tracking, uh, especially when the animals leave the road, we've got to do a bit of guessing. Uh, I, well, educated guessing is probably the better description. And I've still got tracks right here and there. 
So maybe they went straight past the pump house. Let's go check further down Philemon's cut line. Uh, I did hear them roaring when I woke up this morning. It sounded like they were down south somewhere. Uh, maybe, I didn't think they was far west, but maybe they've been moving constantly. So let's keep up. Uh, of course, if we have no luck with these uh, big boys, uh, we're always gonna go check on Nkahuma Pride, who I think probably haven't moved too far from that buffalo kill they made yesterday. While I keep on the lion tracks, hopefully we'll be blessed with some big cats shortly. Uh, let's go see what Byron's plan for the morning is. Good morning everybody, my name's Byron and with me on camera this morning is Jandre and uh, I am currently looking for the Unkahuma Pride. I've come into the area where they were last seen yesterday but it doesn't seem as if there's any sign of them just yet. Looking very, very carefully, we're not where the carcass was that they had yesterday. Well, they were, they actually m um, left that carcass. Apparently there was nothing left of it. So just having a look around here to see if we can find them. But usually what happens with lions after they feed and, and, um, and they finish a carcass, they'll probably head towards some water. The reason for that is because they get very, very thirsty. The blood of, uh, of a lot of animals and especially buffalo and that, that they're feeding on, it's very salty. So generally they do look for water after feeding. But I'm sure we'll have some luck a little bit later. We're going to drive around, see if we can't find some tracks. But it doesn't appear as if they are in this block anymore where they were yesterday. So they have moved off. Nice cool morning. So I'm sure if these lions are moving around, they could potentially be moving for quite some time this morning in this cool weather. They don't, you know, we know lions generally don't like to move too much during the heat of the day when it is very, very warm. Conserve the energy rather for when it's cooler and for, for the evenings. That's when lions do move around a lot. However, saying that, and we've seen in the past, lions are very opportunistic and if there's food around, something that they'd like to potentially hunt, even if it's hot, they will still hunt. And uh, this Inkahuma Pride actually did it a few weeks ago, two, two three weeks ago. Uh, one afternoon, about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they got up and they hunted a buffalo close to some water. And, um, and that is unusual, but it does happen. I think let's take Aubrey's up here to see if they're on tracks of these lions coming out anywhere. What we'll do is we'll do a big loop around this area and see if they are potentially still in the block or if they have moved, um, which direction they've moved to. Possibly, like I say, maybe towards water. So what I think I might do is head towards that Gallagher waterhole, that small little pan, and just go and have a look around there. But I want to scan very, very carefully in this area. some lion tracks here everyone and they are heading it appears as if the fresh tracks are heading in this direction and Dubrat Dave would like to know where's the main water source in Juma so at the moment I would say one of the main water sources probably the Juma Dam um, that's the largest I think dam around at the moment so that would be the main water source on Juma where we are so I mean, look these lines have walked all along here and these tracks do look fresh from this morning sometime perhaps or last night Nothing's driven over them or walked on top of them. Yep. The lines walked all along the road here. 
which is nice very kind of them to walk along the road and again they use the roads because it's a large pathway uh, it's easier for them to move through the bush um, on these roads they don't need to dodge bushes or walk through long grass still seeing little tracks and it looks like little tracks of the cubs too I just want to double check and make sure yep I can definitely see lioness and cub tracks alright so while we follow these tracks let's head back to Brent and see how he's doing with those male lion tracks doing some more educated guessing now from the audio I heard early this morning they were heading south so fingers crossed they haven't quite made it to the southern boundary yet but to ensure they haven't uh, VM and I are going to go down at the southern boundary see if we uh, find anything there also good good chance to check for Queen Karula see if she went south with uh, Hosanna and Shongile I've got a strong feeling She's probably left the cubs sleeping in the, the area where they had that kill yesterday, but you never know. And so we'll have to check there while we're down on the southern end of Juma. Okay, we're on the southern boundary. We're going to be checking carefully, carefully for all sorts of tracks and of course I have of the camera department the best track spotter with me and that's Vim of course he's like an extra tracker so always good uh, Vim's gonna keep a look on the left I'm gonna keep a look on the right morning for birding with a camera uh, good morning Mary in Texas it says was there a Philemon that that road was named after yes Philemon worked at Juma for many many years he has now uh, moved to the Juma in the sky quite some time ago though uh, long before wild earth arrived here but yes, he, he used to maintain the roads and such and such. Oh, what have we got here? No. No lion tracks, no leopard tracks just yet. Now, sometimes this road can be quite difficult for tracks because it is one of the main access roads. So I'm going so slowly because there is quite a lot of traffic uh, on all hours down this road. So far, hippo tracks, and not much else apart from impalalas. Now, coming up ahead is one of Karula's favorite spots to cross, so we're going to be checking there very carefully. Some buffalo tracks around, uh, nothing particularly fresh so far. Now we do spend quite a lot of time checking this road, um, especially because Karula's territory sort of falls on either side of this road. So it is a, it is an area we spend a lot of time. Okay, now this is where we've got to check very, very carefully. Like most lions and leopards like to utilize roads. They like nice big animal paths for them. Okay. Now, 
male lion tracks a lot easier to see. They're about the size of my hand. Karula's tracks about this big. So you've got to look far more carefully for the queen of Juma's tracks than you do for the Birmingham boys. Nope. Good sign, good sign. Elephants around here overnight, but quite early on, there's lots of little nocturnal critters, millipedes, and the such with the tracks that are on top. So, another spot to look for Karula tracks that she comes through quite often. Nothing so far. Looking good, looking good. Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv if you would like to ask us any questions about what we are up to or anything out here in Africa. Now, since we're tracking away here, I think it's uh, time to uh, get your grey matter working. And uh, it is, a, it is a, a quiz we've done before, but I think there's quite a lot of new viewers who might not know. So, my favourite antelope family are the Trafalagids, uh, or the spiral horned antelope, and we get a few of them here, but I'm going to ask you how many spiral horned antelope are there in the whole of Africa? So spiral horned, I'll give you one to start off with. Uh, Kudu is a spiral horned antelope. So how many Trafalagids are there in the whole of Africa? Send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag safari live. And get that gray matter a tuning, a churning on this sunrise safari. Nothing so far. Where have these lions disappeared to? Well, if we don't see tracks, as I said, it's quite a good sign. It means they're still within our traverse area. More buffalo tracks. It doesn't, it doesn't look like they're running from lion tracks, though. They just look like I'm ambling along tracks. Now, there's another big road junction up ahead, which is also quite a popular spot for lions and things to cross, particularly the Birmingham boys. They tend to walk that route. But we just wanted to make sure that there was nothing crossing up this side. Of course, there's still a few firsts for the wet season to find. The first baby warthogs, the first baby wildebeest, the first pygmy kingfisher, the first European oriole, European golden oriole, sorry. Virginia is wondering, is it easier for me to spot the tracks now that I don't have a door? Well, it is, Virginia, particularly when I drive like this. You can use the steering wheel. Oh, that looked like tracks. <laughs> stop, stop being silly, Leo Smith. Uh, what track was that? Well, thank goodness it was only a baboon. Okay, so if the lines have crossed out of Juma, the most likely spot is about 50 meters up ahead. Now, 
Now, Jay is wondering about lion versus leopard tracks. Uh, how do you tell the difference? Well, a lion tracks generally quite easy. I mean, a male lion is the size of my hand. A male leopard is probably only in the side, more size of the the inside of my palm, and that's a very big male. Now, when it comes to, oh no, oh no, that's Karula and the cubs, by the looks of things. Jay, I'll get back to your question now. Okay, so why I say it looks like Karula and the Cubs, there's one track, there's another track. That looks like Karula, and that looks like Hasana. Their tracks are pretty much as we would say in Swahili, Kamakawaida, same, same, same difference. Now, I'm sure if we looked a little bit more carefully, Shongile's tracks will be around here somewhere as well. Okay, well, unfortunately, the royal family has gone back down to the south. We will keep a lookout and an ear out to see if they come back to the west. Hopefully, we don't find any lion tracks on this road and that means we'll go back and start at last tracks again. Okay, so we've got some answers into the quiz and uh, two different ones. We've got nine and seven species. Fuzzman Sparkle says nine and Cece and Aaron say seven. Now, oh, there's Shungile next to him. No, that's good. Oh, that's bad. Oh, it's old. That's good. I don't see more. Just one sticky thing. Uh, I've, I, actually, I actually tracked that one the other day. Okay, so let's run through them together. There are five in Southern Africa. Uh, and of course, I should have clarified, we're not doing subspecies and spe and things that are sort of in the well, not negotiated, but argued by geneticists and stuff like that till they're classified as a species on there and they don't count. So we've got five in Southern Africa, Kudu, Inyala, Bushbuck, Eland. Vim, can you tell me the last one? Uh, <laughs> Vim wasn't listening, it seems like. So we've got Kudu, Inyala, uh, Bushbuck, and Eland. And the last one is? Congo? No, in Southern Africa. Oh, Sitatunga. So a Sitatunga. And look at that. Here is some spiral horned antelope while we're speaking about them. So there's five in Southern Africa. Um, and of course, let's try to get a better view there. And Vim's mentioned another one, Bongo uh, from. West and Central Africa. Now, again, the bongo is argued that there's two species, the East African bongo and the West, uh, but uh, uh, genetically there's not that much difference in them just yet. Hello, little boy. Okay, so we got bongo. And uh, then we have lesser kudu. We have Lord Derby's Eland. And we have Mountain Inyala. So there we go, a very well done to Fuzzman Sparkles, indeed nine different species of Trafalagids. Now, these little boys, they haven't quite developed their large curl that <laughs> of a horn. They've just got little horns, but they're growing up quickly. And they're going to grow up nice, nice and quickly if they keep eating that round leaf teak, nice and nutritious. Oh, and the rain tree. But while we continue our search for the big male lions that so far look like they have not left Juma, and let's go see how Byron's tracking of the Inkahumas is going. So no luck just yet on our tracks either. Done a big loop around. Um, and I, I think these lions may still be in this block off to my left. But let's have a look. What's that on the left of Jandre? Is there something down there? Nothing. Uh, antelope tracks.
So I'm trying to listen out for any alarm calls. Maybe we're lucky and something spots the lines for us and lets us know where they are, more or less. But nothing yet, nothing yet. And so far we've only seen, we've only managed to see one Impala. Um, I had a look for a little lamb, but no sign. I'd love to see, I can't wait to see my first little lamb of the season. There's a big male, there we go. Speaking of Impala, <laughs> big male, oh, he's just running off through the bushes. Can you see him through there? disappearing on us the lone male and that's interesting possibly just a territorial male that uh, well, he's in a nice open area so I'm assuming he would have just stayed here for safety nice and open and possibly some other impala around here earlier just having a careful look it's always difficult to drive and track at the same time I find I'm I do think we miss uh, miss a lot of the tracks. If we are driving and we don't necessarily have a tracker with us, um, it does help sitting on the front of the vehicle while you are driving. It just makes it a lot easier. Also, you know, the guide generally, while he's interpreting the bush to guests and turning around and chatting to the guests, he might miss something up front. And uh, it does help to have a tracker with you who's able to keep an eye out for any tracks or signs of animals crossing the road. Dina, you wanted to know if we are the first vehicles out every morning, Wild Earth, and uh, it sounds like it this morning, definitely, we were the first ones out, and I think we are generally the first ones out, because, I'm trying to think, I think most lodges, if I'm not mistaken, most lodges do a wake up around 5am, and the guests meet on deck at 5.30, or meet in the, in the car park where the vehicles are at about 5.30, and they head out on drive, maybe with a cup of coffee, and a biscuit first. Oh, some zebra. Wonderful. Hang on. Just try to look for a little gap here. Yeah? Oh, beautiful. Some zebra. I'm just trying to see if there's another little gap. Chandra, maybe if I move forward a little bit for you might get a better view of them they seem quite relaxed with us which is good yeah here we go we'll get a lovely view of them from here how's that Isn't that a bit better oh, always great seeing some zebra a dazzle of zebra and I think it's a very appropriate name for, for a group of zebra, a dazzle. Dana, you wanted to know if the zebras actually lie down flat when they do sleep, and they do sometimes, Dana, they will lie down, and I've seen it, especially with zebra foals, uh, the young zebra do lie down, they lie completely flat when they are sleeping, but you must, we need to remember a lot of these animals don't necessarily lie down for long periods of time, but I have seen adult zebras lying down and resting, and uh, maybe for for a few minutes, half an hour, um, and then they generally get up and move again. Because when they are lying down, they are obviously vulnerable uh, to any predators if there are any around. So most of these animals, even though they lie down and rest, it will be a, for a very short period of time and there will most likely be a number of other zebra around, for example, that are keeping a close eye out for any danger or any predators.
some Cape turtle doves calling in the distance. It's a lovely morning and those tails constantly swishing of the zebra keeping the flies away. And it's wonderful if you can. Sometimes you can see um, these zebra, what they do is they stand head to tail and they f flick their tail backwards and forwards to keep, uh, to keep um, the uh, basically to keep the flies out of each other's faces. Now, Adam, you wanted to know how tall the zebra are at the shoulder. Uh, good question. I'll have to see if I can find out. I would say they're probably about 130 centimeters or so. Let's have a look quickly, Adam. Let me try to find out for you. Um, let's see what they say. Yeah, 1.3 meters tall at the at the shoulder. Sure, how's that for a guess? <laughs> so 1.3 meters tall. Um, some sometimes some species may get to about 1.5 centimeters, but generally the um, you know, the, the plain zebra or the birchall zebra, which is the species of zebra that we are seeing right now, is about 1.3 to 1.4 um, meters at the shoulder. Those wonderful stripes, they are beautiful, beautiful animals. Some interesting historical pictures of zebra in Africa. Um, now we've learnt apparently that uh, studies have been done that well, for one you can't really tame zebra or use them for anything. So farmers and that wouldn't have used zebra for, um, for work animals on on farmlands and that. Um, and apparently you cannot really ride a zebra. I've never tried, but the, their backs. Are much weaker than horses, so it wouldn't make sense to to try and use them for that. But there are some some wonderful historic pictures of zebra or subspecies of zebra pulling a, a cart with um, with somebody riding the cart and obviously having these zebra, much like a horse-drawn cart, and having these zebra pull the wagon or the cart. Which is interesting, but that would have been well, maybe 80 to 100 years ago. And there they go. Rena, you want to know if there's only one species of zebra? No, Rena, there are many more. Now, in southern Africa, we've got oh, no, let me make sure I get this right I think we've just got the three species so we've got um, these virtual zebra or the plains zebra which we see in this area so in the greater Kruger it's northeastern part of South Africa that is the only species we get here however down in the southern part of South Africa so in the Karoo we call it um, closer down to the southern coast of South Africa we've got a species known as the Cape Mountain zebra so it's a different species a subspecies of zebra down there and then up to the western side of South Africa too, west and northwest we've got a species called the Hartman zebra and let me see if I can find you some pictures of the different species and all that's really different um, all the subspecies and all that's different is is the shape uh, or is the pattern and the stripes on those zebra and I'll show you here quickly there we go so this image over here has got the Cape Mountain Zebra and the Hartman Zebra on the top. And what we can see is you see how narrow those stripes are, very, very close together. And notice how the stripes stop just before they get to the bottom of the belly and the belly is completely white and very much similar to the Hartman Zebra. That's Hartman Zebra at the bottom, Hartman's Mountain Zebra. And they're called Mountain Zebra because they do climb mountains very, very well. And then at the bottom is the Plains Zebra. It used to be known as the 
Birchall's zebra, so the plain zebra. And these zebra, you can see there's a very distinct uh, difference in the sh in the size of the stripes, much wider apart. And you might also get a slight shadow stripe, which they refer to between the black and the white stripes. That little shadow stripe moving through there. And also the stripes extend right around the belly, so not completely white. And then uh, there are other zebra species up in East Africa, um, Grevy's zebra, uh, Grevy's zebra, uh, what else? Oh, now I'm trying to think. Um, Brent might know better w w which other which other species are up there, um, because Brent did work up in East Africa for a short while. And uh, speaking of Brent, let's over, head over to him now. See how he's doing with those lions. I wonder if he's found them yet. Well, it seems like our lion tracking has come to fruition. And uh, here we go. The two males that we've been tracking all morning, we've found them on twin dams. So it's Mfumo, the authority. You can see how well his little, well, it was, it's now a little, but at one point he's a massive hole in the face. Oh, and I think that's Tinio. I haven't seen decently yet because he's been snoozing but it looks to be Tinio. so there we go two members of the Birmingham coalition oh bless you did you, did you suck in a little bit too much dust there but here we go I th uh, it looks like Tinio, the tooth you can see yeah, I can see that remnant of a split lip just there as he turned. Now, it's quite interesting when we look at both of them here. Now, you can see Tinior's mane is darkening faster. You can see underneath getting really nice and dark. I'm just going to move the vehicle a little bit so we got a good view of both of them. Now that Tinior has decided to raise his head. That's it. Just we want to see the left hand side of your face. Stop turning your head. I know you're watching my tires. Yep, it is definitely Tinio. I'm, I'm happy with that now. We know who they are. Now boys, it's very important. We want roaring this morning. And you've been roaring all morning. I heard you from about four o'clock making lots of noise. Now you need to make some noise for us. They're looking quite well fed. Uh, three of them were seen together yesterday in Buffalo's Hook. So these two plus um, one of the other, Nena or Utsuku. But I haven't seen either of those for quite some time. Big boys. So now this is a perfect, oh, perfect eyes, look at that, stare straight through you. Now you can see the battle scars that litter a male lion and as I'm saying it's, if you can now see his mane quite clearly, see how it's much much darker underneath, there we go, then Mfumos and he's getting that lovely little, oh, sis, let's do some grooming. So, Definitely, you can see that also that dark mohawk starting to form right in the center. And uh, Informa was getting there. Uh, he might be a little bit younger. Now, we don't exactly know the exact ages of all the Birmingham boys, so the coalition has got different ages in it. And he could just be, Tinio could be a little bit older, uh, judging from how dark his mane is and also just how tattered his ears are and stuff in comparison to Mfumo. He's still quite blonde. He is getting that little, there he is, his little neck out of the ear and he's still very battle scarred. And there we go. You see he's just looking a little, little bit more ragged than uh, 
Mfumo. Now, David was wondering who's older, and I'd say there's not much difference between them, maybe a year at most, but Tinio definitely looks to be the older of the two. Now, they're looking to the south, which is bad for us. We want them to look to the north. We want them to hear some commotion that brings them deeper into Juma. We're only about 150 meters, 200 meters away from our southern boundary. And I'm very, very happy we didn't find any lion tracks there. And we found these two beautiful boys. Now, they've walked quite far from where they were yesterday in Buffalo's Hook. They've gone from very close to the Kruger boundary. Uh, they've headed north, or I'm guessing they must have come through around Gauri cut line. We found their tracks on quarantine. So they've probably done a good 10 kilometers to 12 kilometers last night. And uh, they're probably going to rest up. There's always a possibility they might get up and move a bit further to the south, but for now, it looks like they're gonna rest up. Now, it looks like they might have been having a scrap quite recently there we go there's some fresh sort of punctures oh and you can see on his foot there it looks like a bit of blood yeah there's a little red dot there a little bit to the left see looks like some fresh blood there um and there's some looks like a fresh scratch a little bit higher and some puncture marks now this is not uncommon male lions always boxing with something, each other, or of course the females, or even some marauders, but more than likely each other. Oh, isn't that, isn't that, isn't that wonderful how well that's healed? But if we go down to his nose, he's obviously tired of smelling himself, and he's smelling a little wild aniseed. So he's inhaling the licorice. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Remember, this is 100% live, so we never know what's going to happen next. They are snoozing currently, but they might jump into action. I'm really hoping that they give us a big roar. Uh, you can see they're both looking very well fed, big bellies, and he's managed to urinate all over himself. Uh, that's not uncommon with male lions. They just sort of lie there and urinate. They're not too worried with personal hygiene. using his foot as a pillar. Hi, uh, Brandon, who's in Rhode Island, who's wondering how long the Birmingham Coalition has been in power. Now, the first sort of serious pushing they did of the Matimbas, if I remember correctly, was October last year. And uh, I'd say probably by January, February, they were in full reign, even though they hadn't quite managed to subjugate all the females in the area. Oh, yes, life's tough. So, about about seven, eight months now, probably eight, closer to eight months, that they've been been the top coalition in the area. Now, as I said, they're probably about six years old, around six, between six and seven, which means unless uh, another big coalition of males comes in, they're looking probably to sit on the top for the next three years or so, probably even about four years on the top. Uh, that's quite normal. What did you hear, mister? What did you smell? Oh, uh, nothing that interesting. Or oh, head down. Of course, there used to be five of them. Uh, the one that was known as Tsotsi or Skabanga or Scrapper, and lots of different names. Uh, he, he expired due to a wound caused from a buffalo hunt. Now, lion genetics are, are quite an interesting thing, and they are very, very varied. And uh, 
Okay, so we'll, we'll get back to genetics now. He's going to answer a, quick, a question quickly from Marion, uh, who's it's a double header, and it's how do coalitions form, and how long do they last? Now, how they form, there's a couple of ways that they form. Uh, the most common way is that a group of related males, uh, possibly brothers or half-brothers uh, of, of a similar age will leave their natal or f home pride together. Now, of course, moving out in a group gives them a better chance of survival than heading out singly. Uh, the other way, which is also quite common, is that you might get two related males who will move out of an area and then they during their nomadic phase uh, they might bump into two unrelated males or one unrelated male and then they join up and uh, because there is strength in numbers now particularly in this in this part of uh, the the Kruger Park and, and and South Africa you you get very big coalitions and if we just go through the the coalitions and the size they started at you had the Mapohos there were six and the Majingalans five I think uh, the Sand River males down south, there's four of them. And now we've got originally five Birminghams. The Salati males were originally four or five as well. Now that's because there's such competition between the coalitions here uh, for females, for breeding rights, for territory, that a single male f will find it very difficult to survive. Oh, my timbers I nearly forgot were originally five as well. Now, what happens sometimes is coalitions over time might split, to answer the second part of your question, Marion. Normally, they'll stay together as long as possible till they are killed by normally other lions. But uh, So generally, the coalition will probably form when the animals are three, three to four years old, and they'll last till they die, so 12, 12 years old. Now, of course, in certain circumstances, animals die quite young, like Scrapper did. He, he died before he was six years old and due to a wound from a buffalo. So there's no sort of hard and fast rule about how, how long coalitions will survive, but I'd say generally once they're in power, four to five years is, is a good sort of estimate uh, of how long these coalitions will survive. Now we're chatting about, I was going to start chatting about genetics and lions. Now there's Originally, I think there were 37 subspecies named. Now, these have all been broken down, brought down. Uh, there are only two distinct subspecies, and that is the African lion and the Asiatic lion. The Asiatic lion lives in India. Now, if we go, let's stick on the African lions for now. You've got Western clade and Eastern clade lions, uh, which is which is which is quite interesting. So, uh, almost down the middle of Africa, you've got two different clades that are slightly genetically different, but nothing near. But, uh, enough to call them a different species and they cross over in a couple of spots but if you look carefully it's 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 actually fascinating so uh, Kruger lions and Tanzanian lions are quite closely related uh, Botswana is related Botswana because it's in the middle is related to both uh, so it, it's it's a fascinating thing if you look at the genetics and I've been fortunate enough uh, to work uh, on uh, uh, one of the big genetic lion uh, projects with a, an, uh, a, a non-profit organization called the Af African, I'm trying to remember the acronym now, APCRO, the African Predator Conservation Research Organization. Um, and that is run by a very good friend of my dad's, a guy by the name of Dr. Mike Briggs. And he's one of the leading experts on lion genetics uh, in the, in the world. And he is the one who taught me all about clades and, and, and where the different lines come from. And I'm just racking my brain for a bit more information. It's been a while since I read all those papers, but I'm sure I'll remember. Now, of course, a lot of, a lot of the genetic stuff is that you've got these uh, Kalahari lions or Cape lions that are extinct and, and Barbary lions um, or oh, woodlands. <laughs> we'll see if we can find him just now. Uh, but now with uh, being able to test the museum sort of 
taxidermistry samples and things like that and uh, there's almost no difference you will find lions in desert areas tend to develop much bigger manes uh, and the reason for that is the, is the climate they're in and uh, that's to protect them from the sandstorms uh, and from the heat it's not not so much because they're a different species ah, there we go this is what I was thinking about uh, so for example quite interesting West African lions which are up in the Sahel region so Chad and Sudan going up that side are actually more closely related to the Asiatic lion than they are to sub-Saharan lions uh, than well, to the South and East African lions uh, which probably means that that the Asiatic lions during the last land bridge between Africa and Asia moved through from that area which makes sense it's closest to the land bridge of dinner plate feet. A nice full belly. Now Big Blue's wondering whether wild lions have dew claws like domestic cats. Indeed they do. Let's see if we can find one. trying to find out sorry there's a bit listing there's an update on Karula I was just listening to the radio um, that sounds like they might have found it down in the in the south but let's carry on chatting about lions and uh, so generally the way they without mit mitochondrial DNA the way they separate species is from skull morphology so differences, slight differences in the skull uh, and it has to be present in more than sort of 80% of the skulls modified for it to actually go through, or not modified <laughs> examined uh, for it to go through so it is it is amazing that uh, Savo lions for example in, in, in Kenya are far more closely related to Kruger lions than lions on the western side of, of Kenya. Now the, the, the clade system is separated by the Great Rift Valley. Now in East Africa the Great Rift Valley is very very obvious. Uh, out here in South Africa it's not so obvious but there is a fault line that runs all the way from Kenya uh, down through South Africa uh, we're on the eastern side of that fault line at the moment and it goes out to sea in Lake St Lucia in northern Zululand so it is incredible if you look at the geology underneath and of course uh, at certain times maybe the, the Great Rift Valley was a far more of a in, insurpassable or more difficult to pass than it is now and, and that's what separated these lions uh, hundred thousand years ago so now now there is also the middle they're not called a clade but they're just called the the middle lines which seem to be a combination of both western and eastern clade lines and uh, those occur sort of through central Zambia and into Botswana Botswana very interesting has both clades and the middle clade so it's got all three now of course they can still all interbreed and they haven't been separated for long enough to, near, to even close become a distinct species. Lovely bird calling and uh, giving us the ambient sounds, we've got that which is an orange-breasted bushrike. We heard the chitter of a woodlands kingfisher. What else can we hear? Oh, there we go. Definitely Tino. You can see that wound. And here, the valence cuckoo as well. Deirdre's cuckoo. Class's cuckoo. So they're probably not going to move too much 
uh, this morning uh, and said they've probably done a good 10 to 15 kilometers overnight. Mail lines are capable of doing further than that. They can walk up to 25 kilometers if, if they need to, uh, but it is unusual. Normally you'll find five to 10 kilometers is their general sort of, sort of movement. Uh, and also it all depends whether they rushing off to chase off invaders or they're just doing a good a good scent marking and boundary patrol they were roaring a lot last night and that's why we jumped further to the south to try find them Morning, Karen. Karen's wondering if there have been any other male lines in this area recently apart from the Birmingham Coalition. Uh, Karen, there were two Avoca males that snuck through the corner and into Sibambili. They had now gone south. Uh, and I heard there were some young males that came onto Incoral from the Kruger, but way too young to sort of challenge the Birmingham boys. Uh, no adult sort of or real challenges to the Birmingham's throne in the last while. But. Uh, it could change tomorrow, and that's the thing. You never know what's going to happen out here in the African bush. Now, you've seen Byron and myself searching around the African bush. There's a third person who's getting moving, and it's Steph on a bushwalk. So let's go see what his plan is for the morning. Good morning, good morning. Yes, we are live and we are walking across quarantine as we speak. Now, I have been watching the show for the first little bit of this morning and I am told, or I understand at least anyway, that Byron couldn't find the lions. They're in some big block and that's exactly what this bushwalk is good at doing, is walking through the middle of big blocks of bush and covering whatever's inside there. For those of you who are just joining the show or are new to this show and, and uh, want to know what do, are we doing, my name is Stefan Winterwood and I'm a wilderness trails guide. And what we do is we uncover the bush from a different angle. Foot safaris or safaris on foot and safaris on vehicles is how people have been exploring Africa for the last hundred years or so. And um, it's a very, very exciting, very novel way of seeing things from a different aspect or from seeing things from a different point of view. And also our focus is slightly different. Of course, we don't get as close as what the vehicles can get to all these animals. Um, but it can be a lot more exciting or can be as exciting. Let me, let me rephrase that. And then also we have an interest in a lot of different things at the ground level so to speak and uh, I'm hoping that over the next couple of hours that I can show you some of what interests me and some of uh, these special little attributes now the wind isn't the best for us tracking lions this morning I must be honest it's blowing from us into the area where we hope to be tracking these lions into and um, while wind is a factor with lion tracking, I don't know, in my experience I have a, a mixed feeling about wind direction. I, I, I'm not against lions knowing that I'm there. It, lends, it gives them that much more growling distance, at least anyway, before you stumble on some sleeping cats, at least anyway. Now, we are as interactive as what Brent and Byron are, so you're welcome to send through any questions or comments that you have to the bushwalk. You can do that via the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can use the email address questions at wildearth.tv, and we'll try and get through as much as what is relevant. Um, all right. Now, my world, your music, these handles are unbelievably uh, sort of engineered of well good morning to you firstly and secondly um, you've asked if we could find a solifuge yes I can try and find your solifuge no problem we're in that transition period uh, between the nocturnal solifuges which are admittedly much bigger and much scarier they go like this big as big as my hand uh, to the diurnal daytime solifuges which are much smaller much more fast moving and then also a lot hairier in actual fact they they run around here like little balls of hairy lightning um, so we're in that transition period between the two 
generally speaking one is strictly nocturnal in other words just nighttime we see them coming out in proper dark the other one is strictly down and we see them running around in the heat of the day midday so now is a, it's going to be a bit of a challenge but if we find one i'll absolutely show it to you so just keep on watching that's the key that's the secret these things happen quite quick now we are live the same as Brent and Byron, which means that what I'm seeing pretty much a couple of seconds later, depending on where you are on the globe, uh, you are watching. So we don't quite know what's around the corner. We don't quite know what's around the next bush. And for that, we've just got to keep our eye open from time to time. Now, I have been waffling on for quite some time. So I think what we're going to go and do is go and have a look at what Byron's up to. And we'll catch up with you in a little bit. We've been looking around and trying to see what we can find, but it's been a, actually a little quiet, quieter this morning. We're approaching Biffleshook Dam now. I'm, might be something around the water, but again, it is cool. It is windy, so animals possibly looking for some shelter in the thickets, trying to stay out of the wind. Even that resident hippo, it appears like it. No, I'm going to stop up on the dam wall. We can scan around and see what we can find. Maybe there's some interesting little birds, maybe just listen out a little bit. Any signs of animals? Perhaps we hear some elephant breaking branches. As I say that, look what I found everyone, an elephant off to the right, have a look, there we go, I heard a little branch break, <laughs> there it is, fantastic, let me see if I can get us a little bit closer, ah, you see, good things come to those with patience, and you stop and listen, things happen for you in the bush, I'm a strong believer in that. See if we can get a nice view. It looks like just the one. Don't see any others just yet. Uh, can you get him through there? I think that's our best view for the moment. Actually, hold on a second. Hold on a second, genre. Sorry. He's right in the thicket there. And he's hiding from us a little bit. I'm just going to see which way if he decides to move again. Um, and possibly try and get another view of him. Uh, hang on, maybe down in the dip. It's amazing how these big, massive animals, these elephants, can uh, disappear into a thicket so easily. He's, I mean, he's standing right there. As Jandro spotted, there are two of them. There's another one through the back. <laughs> it's so difficult. Look, standing dead still. You can just see the tusks. Some very, very loud Franklin calling. And that other one's breaking a branch through the back. Can't believe it's so thick through here. Hang on, we'll just uh, we'll sit and wait. Maybe we're lucky and they do decide to come out. Now, I want to 
assume, and I can't really see just yet, but I think these are two bulls, two big bulls that are hanging around together, and that's not unusual. The males often move away from the herds, and especially the big dominant males, and what they do is they'll try and find herds while they're moving around. They'll go and feed, and if they pick up on the scent of a herd, they'll go move in and see if there are any females to potentially mate with. And you do get these groups of males that move around together. Usually an older male might be followed by a younger, more inexperienced male, and the older male then teaches the youngster. Oh, look. Oh, this one's pushing over this tree. Wow. So much power. Isn't that incredible? Just to get to some of the branches at the top. So as I was saying, these older males then teach these younger males where to find food and how to be successful and how to find the females. Look at that, these massive, two massive animals hiding in this thicket. And again, this could be linked to the wind. Maybe they've decided it's better to be in the middle of these trees and out of the wind. I wonder if I can't, let me try to go back a little bit. I just want to see if I can't get a better view for you. Maybe if we go back here. But as you can see, it's very, very thick through here. A lot of Tamburti trees around here. Charging off to the western area, the western edge, I've heard a report of an animal that would make me leave almost all animals. I wonder who knows what it is. Of course you do. Uh, apparently there's a pack of wild dogs on their way towards Juma, and I'm trying to get in the right area to be there when they cross, because we all know how fast wild dogs are, and uh, we don't want to miss them. My favorite animal in the African bush, the African wild dog, or painted dog, or painted wolf. So much of excitement. So apparently they might come out around Impala Plains, so I'm going to get onto uh, Triple M there and uh, just move up and down waiting for them to cross. Try and make sure we're in the right spot when they do. that are now getting mobile, or is it going to be some of the dispersal packs we've been seeing? Uh, the three members of the Lower Sabi, or the three members of the Ng uh, Ngala pack originally. I am fascinated to find out.
exactly where we planned for them to pop out. Last I heard, they were in Arethusa. So, fingers crossed they don't change their mind and go south. They must keep coming north, north, north. We want all the animals to come north when we're in the south and west. And when we're on the northern boundary, we want everyone to come south. So, it all just depends on where you are. And I'm sure a lot of the people on the other side of Gary Main are saying, go south, 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 or go east, east. I mean, not east. Whoopsie, that's a big bump. That's a new one. West, west, west. Very big bumps here now. They obviously heard I was coming this way for wild dogs and quickly made some bumps. I heard was correct that they would be coming from around the Red Dam area. Oh, but there's a big herd of impalas. Let's see if there are any babies. there was some dispute about my spiral horned antelope quiz. Let's see. They're saying, Do, don't impala have spiral horns? Um, there's a male here. We're going to have a look at it right now. Where'd he go? And the answer is they do not. They have ribbed horns. So they do go outward and inward. Where are they now? Where's the male gone? Oh, there he is. And you see how they go out and in, but they've got ribs, circular ribs around them, and uh, not spirals. No babies in this herd just yet. Now, the biggest danger to baby impala out of all the animals in the African bush is wild dogs. I've seen them kill nine baby impala in the space of 20 minutes, each wild dog having its own baby. So while we're sitting here, I'm just listening to the radio, trying to get an update on where those dogs are. Now, in theory, if they kept heading in the direction they were, they should come almost right through the middle of this herd of impala, which could cause absolute pandemonium. Okay, I'm just going to be on the radio for a second. Morning stations in the west. Can I have an update for safari, please? Hmm. I thought I was on high enough ground to get that radio to work. Alas, no. No one is replying. Oh, there we go. Is that a reply? In broken static. Oh, look at that. You can see that sideways chewing ruminant. Oh, let's give ourselves a bit of a groom. Got an itchy spot.
Okay, well, I'm going to try to figure out what's going on on the radio while I do that. Uh, and Byron has got some great big grey pachyderms. And this, he stopped and he just watched us. We are quite close to him. And he stopped to watch us, but it looks like he's relaxed again and we might be lucky, he might cross the road in front of us. Our oh, magnificent animals. I love watching these big elephant bulls and spending time with them. I don't want to move the vehicle too much now because we are uh, fairly close to him and he, he, did, he didn't show any signs of aggression but he did lift his head a little bit and just look at us and there are little signs that you do need to look out for. Something like that just shows that he's not completely comfortable um, but now the fact that he's started to feed again is a good sign and I always say a feeding elephant is a happy elephant. If they stop feeding and they're watching you, then, then you know they're not that happy with you being around. Hang on, here he comes. Here he comes. That's it. Come out in front of us, please. He's deciding to take the road. <laughs> I will move forward a little bit. Let's have a look at him. And there's still another one in the bushes behind us. You can't see him at all. See, just like that elephant stopped and he's turned and he's peering at us. But watch out that. And Lynn, it was, look at that. Wow. Look at the power, everybody. Wow, isn't that amazing? And Lynn, you were saying, and you're watching via periscope, and you say, um, isn't that amazing camouflage for such a large animal? And it is indeed. It definitely. They can easily disappear through the, or through the thicket or into the bushes. This big bull just pushed that tree over just to get to the leaves at the top. Probably a bit tastier for him. As I was saying, there is still another bull behind us, but in through the bushes, we actually can't see him from where we are sitting now. I can just hear the odd branch break now and then from him also feeding. Oh, look at those tusks, beautiful. The two very large bulls that we found here. Okay, we, uh, I think I'd like to sit with these elephants a little bit longer. Just see what they get up to and see if that other big bull comes out. And while we do that and see if we get you a better view, let's head over to the bushwalk to Steph and see what he's got. So we have arrived in the area where Byron last had those lion tracks, which is around about the Sandy Patch, Old Breeze Road area. And now we've just been sitting for the last couple of minutes while you've been with those elephant, just listening to the bush around us. It's quite important that when you don't know where lions are or you don't know where an animal is, quite often you just have to sit still and rather than manically running around, you just have to listen and feel the bush a little bit and it'll tell you some stuff. And right off the bat, it was about 30 or 40 seconds ago a noise happened into this bush here in front of us inside there it sounded like a sneeze could have been something bumping against another thing I mean there's any variety of animals out here that could make a noise like that zebra sneeze quite often uh, giraffe make weird noises all variety of weird noises uh, elephant rhinoceros and buffalo could, doesn't have to just be a lion but since we're looking for lions in this area, 
and there's this weird noise it does warrant a little bit of an inspection but as I promised I want to show you something that has been a, a mystery to me this particular season going from the dry season into the wet season it's something that I don't really have an answer for but I'd really like to share it with you um, as some of you might know I really enjoy ants and this is a little species of grainy vorous ant and what that means is that I've seen them eating grains, eating the grains of, of seeds off of grasses. But they are also, as far as I can see, they also are carnivorous. You can have a look at it. You'll see that they are dragging the body of another ant, and it's definitely not the same species. Here we have it again. Now, what has perplexed me is not the fact that these ants eat both grains and uh, meat. It's the fact that they cement with a glue the entrance to their burrows. And it is a very hard calcrete substance. I'm going to show you here. I've just cleared the entrance to their burrow there. You can see that this is eroding away, but this isn't and it's because that entrance to that hole is as hard as a piece of cement and the only reason that I can think of that it is like that is as a flood and erosion deterrent so some ants thatch the entrance to their burrows and that stops water from going into their burrow and it stops the lip of the of the entrance burrow eroding inside which of course takes time to clear these ants i think create these cement tunnels on the outside edge of their of their nests for exactly the same reason water will come along and erode next to their entrance burrow uh, the sand creating a little bit of height and the water will then flow around the burrow and flow and flow away from the burrow rather than flowing into the burrow and it's the only thing that I can think of that they why they would cement and glue the entrance to their their tunnels that is literally it'll wear away my fingernail if I scratch it away I mean I'll eventually break it down of course but it is much harder than than the softer sand around it I don't know what species of ant these are. I haven't, there's very, very few good resources for being able to identify ants. There are more common ants, of course, are in all our insect books, but this is not a common ant at all. It's a common ant here, but it's not something that I've seen commonly around. They've done particularly well this year, and it's just because there's been so little grass cover that I've actually been able to see their entrance burrows that I was actually able to observe these ants for the first time in about 17 or 18 years of walking around here in the Kruger National Park. Exciting, eh? All right. Now, we have been listening here for long enough, and I think it's a good idea that we follow this game path. You can see it going through the bush over here. Lion, like most other animals, quite enjoy walking on pathways like this, and it's always a good place to start looking for footprints, is right here on these paths, either crossing over the paths or walking on them. At some point, if lions are in the area, they absolutely will walk here. So, keeping our eyes peeled for any sort of signs and markings. So, Paul, you've just remarked on those ants. You've just said, does that mean that the ants are omnivores? Yes, it does mean that, that the ants are omnivores, meaning that they eat a variety of different food sources. These, those particular ants eat anything from grain that I've seen. And at the entrance burrows, when it was summer, they'd throw the husks of their grain, the, hus the, the outside covering of the grain, about a hand span from the entrance to their burrows in this arc. Um, but I have also seen them eating snails. I've seen them, I've seen the discarded husks of the single banded snail around the entrance to their burrows. And as you just witnessed there, they definitely are cannibalistic on other ant species as well. They definitely were drawing to the burrow entrances other ants. And that's not uncommon. Ants are quite, uh, 
how do I say, catholic in their diets in that they will eat virtually anything that they can get their, their jaws into. You do get specialists, of course, but these particular ants look like they're generalists and it's probably why they're doing so well in this area. Now, we are going to send you over to Byron, who I'm told has some elephant for you. And we are still sitting with this beautiful big bull just off to the side. I've moved a little bit closer. He's still very relaxed and feeding. Look at those beautiful eyes. Rich amber color. If you do have a closer look, and look at those long eyelashes too. Isn't that incredible? That is beautiful. That is very, very beautiful texture of the skin and everything. You can see there's a bit of mud that is caked around the, his forehead and the, the back of his head and that's probably just from dust bait. Listen. Did you hear that? Uh, that was an elephant communicating, just a low frequency um, vocalization possibly communicating with the uh, with the other bull that wasn't too far don't know where that other bull is now and um, there was one out around here earlier I haven't heard him again he's possibly still through the thicket or maybe he's moved off a little bit but uh, it's wonderful to get so close to this beautiful male right here have him call like that Let's see what he does Hoping he moves out into the open a little bit more. This this elephant's been a little bit shy this morning. He's been hiding in the in the thickets or behind trees. Mike, you, you mentioned that um, the female elephants in India don't have tusks. We wanted to know if the African elephants, if the females have tusks, they do indeed. Now, Mike, I'm just, I'm just trying to think. Um, I'd like to double check that because, I, I mean, and oh, there we go. There's a big elephant coming down the road towards us. Let's just see, there he is. Hello. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? And there is the other one. So he snuck around very, very quietly through the branch, through the trees, and just come to join this other bull, and now they're mo moving off together. Isn't that a lovely sighting? So back to your question, occasionally you can have elephants, perhaps the tusks have broken off, and once they have broken off, they don't grow back. But also, I have seen elephants where the tusks actually do not grow out. That could just be a, a, a genetic thing that they, um, or genetic reason that perhaps the tusks have not grown out for um, for some reason. I'm not sure why, but it can happen at times. And I have seen elephants without tusks. But uh, but generally speaking, all the elephants in Africa, especially, they do have tusks that do grow out. Um, and you do get the odd exception where you don't see any tusks on an elephant. So I wonder if that doesn't happen with some of the Indian elephants too. Um, but I'm not sure. I'd, I'd, like I said, I don't know much about the Indian elephant in terms of their tusks and who has, or why the females, you say the females don't have tusks. That's interesting. I wonder why. Tracy, the African elephant is not endangered at the moment. Oh, listen to those branches breaking. So the African elephant's not endangered. There are plenty of elephant throughout Africa. They are a threat though because of the poaching that goes on and you wanted to know about the poaching. Yes, the poaching is still an issue in various parts of Africa. 
fortunately for us in southern Africa the poaching of elephant is not very very bad um, and they are very well protected especially countries like Botswana there are huge elephant populations in Botswana but the, the, the Botswanan government are very strict with controlling any poaching or any hunting within their country they are very very strict with that and they monitor it very closely South Africa too we do have strict laws anti-poaching units so we do protect these animals as much as possible so the elephant's not endangered at all but um, but you know we would still have to look after them and make sure that in other parts of Africa especially up in East Africa there is still a lot of poaching of elephant for ivory going on there fortunately not as much down in the southern hemisphere down in southern Africa Well, this has been a really, really great surprise to spend time with these two big bulls. I'm going to move forward a little bit, just see if we get another view of that one male. The other one has moved off. Um, see if we get another view of this male and then possibly leave them. Let's just see. It looks like, well, he did push over a branch or tree rather. Small tree just to get to some of the leaves. Ah, there he is. That's a wonderful view. Also some beautiful big tusks on this male. Look how they wrap their trunk around the branches to break them off. They'll also use the tusks to help break the branches. And if you have a look, I wonder if you can see it clearly there. On that left tusk uh, sorry so <clears throat> his left tusk the way we look at it the tusk on the right um, just at the tip you can see uh, and I was hiding it a little bit from us hang on let's just see if he moves that tusk out again I'd like to show you something interesting but um, where is it there uh, just can you see there's a, a a distinct groove in that tusk it's very interesting so I'll show you what happens you see that and then so the distinct groove on that left tusk and then on his right tusk you can see it's quite worn down on the tip there too um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something shortly once I leave this elephant We've had a wonderful sighting of them. I think we're going to give them some space, let them enjoy their their feeding, and uh, we'll move on from here. But then I do want to show you something interesting about those another ear hole for the elephant is in front, and you should see it over there. That's the ear hole. Um, right there. That's the ear hole. So it's in the front of the ear. And uh, that is where it is hiding, just in there. All right, so I'm just going to move on from here. What a wonderful sighting with this elephant. And I want to sh just show you and explain to you what I meant by this, those tusks and why I wanted to show you that little groove. Now just give me a second. So let me just jump out here and show you quickly. So what happens? What happens is while the elephants are feeding, they'll go and they'll take their trunks, as we saw, and they wrap it around the branches and they break the branches. But occasionally, with some branches and with a lot of grass, they wrap their trunk around the grass. And what they do is they use their tusk to actually pull the grass and by pulling the grass or the leaves or the trees and the branches constantly over that same part of the 
tusk it actually starts grinding in and you get that very very clear groove which we saw on that tusk so it's incredibly interesting to see how the grass can actually start cutting into the tusk a little bit and that's obviously years and years of using that tusk to help tear and break grass and you get these very clear grooves and then with the right tusk that we saw um, it's possibly right tusk dominant. You can sometimes see elephants will choose to use one tusk over the other and maybe if they're scraping or tearing bark they'll use that one tusk more often than the other one and you then see it shaving down or becoming slightly um, uh, worn down from tearing bark and tearing branches off of trees or using it to dig so you can see those signs very very clearly on the tusks isn't that interesting so we're going to continue our way down this road see what else we can find um, it was wonderful to spend time with those elephants I think let's head back to Steph who's still on his bushwalk and see if he's managed to find any more lion tracks So we're almost certain that those lions were chasing around some more buffalo again last night. I mean, it's not uncharacteristic or anything for these Nkuhuma ladies. After all this time, they've been feasting on nothing but buffalo over the last couple of months. But what gives me that idea and that impression is the fact that there's so many tracks of buffalo heading, all at the same age, heading in the same direction. And I'll see if I can try and find you one, um, just to show you what I'm talking about. One that's probably a little bit f clearer than just a vague impression in the sand. <laughs> All right, let's carry on walking in this direction. Ah, here we go. So here's a buffalo track. Here we go here. So that is the fresh track of a Cape buffalo. And you can see, relatively big. I mean, I would say that that is probably not the biggest buffalo track I've ever seen, but it is the back foot of a buffalo track, and that means that it is the smaller of the two feet. And all of these tracks are heading in this direction, which means that to find these lion, we've got to walk in this direction. But you can see how the vegetation is starting to thicken up over here, and how we are having to walk through with much more caution than what we were doing literally just a few weeks ago. And that's because we've got to take our time to make sure that nothing is lying on the other side of a bush on a carcass. As you'd know, lions are, are, can be dangerous when you approach them in an area where their cubs can't get away from. So we know that these lioness have got cubs with them. We know that they're going to be quite defensive over a piece of meat that they have, over a meal. The cubs are not going to be going anywhere because they're on that meal. And so it always is advisory to just move through with caution. So we take a couple of steps to the other side of this thicket. That's how we do it. And then we wait and see, see what's on the other side of the next thicket. So let's see how we do it. Okay, this tells me something about the relative age or freshness of this of these tracks. Now, Corey, I'll get to your uh, I'll get to your question now about what are we going to do if an animal does charge us right after I do this. This is a very good sign to give us an indication of how old those buffalo tracks were. This is the buffalo dung from those buffalo that we're running away. You can see it's relatively fresh. It has a it has a skin on top of it, which means that it was probably done at some point early in the evening, yes, last night. And you can see these circular mounds of sand. These are from dung beetles that have already processed this dung. They've already processed the dung into balls which they have now buried underneath the dung itself. And this tells me that these buffalo were running through here not early this morning, but probably early yesterday, early yesterday evening. It takes some time for buffalo dung to get worked over like this, a good couple of hours at least anyway. So a good couple of hours old already. But it doesn't mean that the lions didn't catch these buffalo. It just means that this particular buffalo tracks that we're seeing are not as fresh as I thought they were. Now, Corey, on to your uh, question about what we would do if a lion charges us. Now, although it's incredibly scary when an animal decides to shout at you out of 
under the bush and if that animal feels threatened enough to actually warrant chasing you out of their area it's just a very clear message to say please just give us some space um, it's it's a communication that they have with us it's a very scary communication and one that you can't mistake for anything else but essentially it's just a message you are way too close to me I need you to create distance and so that's what we try and do what you don't want to do is act submissive so what we don't want to do is turn your back and run through the bush that to a lion is just a signal to chase you down what you want to try and do is go hey I see you so you make a big noise I see you like this please don't come you can talk whatever the language that comes out of people's mouths is in these types of situations is quite impressive but you go hey I see you and then immediately if that animal stops you create distance so you walk back maintaining eye contact with the lion that's what you want to do and walking backwards as much as what you can if that lion comes again at you hey, you stop shouts at that lion generally they stop and as soon as you've created you cross this imaginary line it's sort of the event horizon basically which doesn't elicit a charge anymore you can get to a point where those lines feel that you've moved a sufficient amount of distance not to represent a threat to themselves their food or their cubs or their mate in the case of a, li of a male lion and generally they'll just calm down uh, you know the, the the aggression sort of de-escalates exponentially after you've crossed that minimum line and that's similar for most of the animals out here elephant hippopotamus rhino uh, buffalo they're all pretty much the same they just want you to leave them alone in some instances though you can't back away and that is when you have when you have gotten too close to them for instance if a lioness was sleeping on the other side of a bush and her cubs are suckling on her she didn't hear you coming because of the wind blowing in in you know too hard in her ears and you startle that animal from a very close uh, proximity what will happen is that animal in instantaneously in the brain makes a decision I either need to get out of here to save my life it's called the flight reflex or I need to fight and that is inst it's an instinctive instantaneous decision in that case uh, it is a difficult thing to say the outcomes are so varied and it's so down to the situation and and how you react at any given time um, but it can end badly uh, you, you can you can be mauled by an animal that makes an, a, a decision to f to fight you um, you can harm that animal if uh, you decide to fight back <coughs> if we were armed for instance um, but you don't want to get into that situation and so we try as much as what we can to try and be as as quiet as we can in some instances and in thick bush areas I like to make a noise so that animals that are in front of us actually know that we're coming and can either move off or growl at us from a from a relative distance away um, so that's that really Corey I hope I answered your question over there I mean the best thing to say is come over to Africa come on a walk walk into something big and scary and see how you feel after the end of that it is a thing that will change your life forever it's um, like being in a car accident I suppose or jumping off a bridge with an elastic band tied to your ankle it's a uh, it's it it's definitely a life-changing experience <laughs> come along Now, Marie, um, you've asked me what is the oddest thing that I've ever ventured upon in the bush while on foot, I suppose, Marie. Um, well, I'll answer it from the on-foot perspective, just because we're walking around here today. Um, wow. The thing that springs immediately to mind is uh, one of the very first encounters I ha ever had with lion on foot. I was walking with my tracker and dear friend, Mr. Richard Indubani, and uh, we were tracking some lion tracks through the bush on the road. And uh, we were walking on the road and the tracks of the lions just disappeared. And we were searching about, now you, you can imagine two full grown men walking around looking like chickens trying to peck at the, 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 the floor, looking for signs of these lions. And I looked up at a noise and probably from about the distance of these trees that you see over here, just this, this row of trees that you see here, some zebras started to run at us. And in between us and the zebra this lioness jumped out of the grass and I'm talking about here like six or seven feet or yards in front of us and leapt upon this zebra 
while we were standing there watching and next thing lions just came pouring out of the bush from all around us at that stage the pride of lion was 24 lions strong it was made up of some males two males some females i can't remember the exact number six or seven and the rest were all cubs and they jumped onto the zebra with me standing right here and, and um, with my tracker standing even closer richard was even closer to this action he was probably two or three yards away and they proceeded to to ignore us completely and kill the zebra with us standing there watching it on foot the cubs came out to the kill and eventually after about two or three minutes richard judged it safe enough to say hey, we can back off now and we slowly backed away from the scene and it remains to this day one of the most surreal experiences i've ever had in my life it, it is I was on foot five yards or six yards away from this zebra being caught by lions. I'd walked into the middle of their hunt and they were so focused on the hunt, they didn't mind us walking into them. They didn't stand up and growl at us. It was just one of those things that I feel at least anyway was one of the most bizarre things that ever happened to me or that I witnessed in the bush. Most definitely. This is a cattail grass, one of the first grasses that come up in this in the summer, and also a grass that does incredibly well in areas that are a little bit overgrazed or a little bit trampled. This grass enjoys those areas. Now I can see that this grass has got some flowers on it. Have a look close to the stem, you will see this grass is flowers and believe me when i say that grasses have some of the most beautiful flowers that you can find they're also one of the most advanced plants in the world grasses have only recently evolved and they come obviously in all shapes and forms and sizes have taken over most of the world's biomes in terms of biodiversity and mass biomass and this is just nice to see those big full pollen heads closest to the middle part of the grass now I'm not going to pick this grass and tell you where it gets its name from but you can see well I can show you really you can see that the grass tail looks like a cat's tail a bristled cat's tail and also when it gets wet it smells a bit like a wet cat as well it's got this most unpleasant smell when you wet it and you smell it all right <laughs> why don't we go and see what Brent's up to <laughs> Unfortunately, that report of wild dogs turned out to be false, uh, misinformation, but no worries, maybe we'll find our own wild dogs. Now, I've made my way into the area where the Nkahumas last were, I've seen the tracks, the tracks are now cutting further to the northwest, so I'm going to head towards Sydney's waterhole, that's probably the closest water from where they were on that buffalo kill, so there's a good chance they're in that area. Now, while why Vim and I have been gone for so long. We had one of those things that happens quite frequently out here in the African bush. We had to change a tire, but it has changed and we are A for okay as long as we don't get a second one. A second flat that is. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm checking very carefully here, see if the lines haven't meandered further to the west, fingers crossed, they haven't gone west or north, we're in a tight little corner of Juma like this, and uh, very close to boundaries on both sides, but the Nkormas haven't been up into this area for quite some time, now that they're moving again, that's a good sign, hopefully they're recovering quickly, maybe that last buffalo they ate was quite fatty after all. Uh, that is not a lion, that is an impala. We'll keep going. Mm -hmm. 
Now there are some pans around here that hold water, but no tracks heading across the road, so more than likely the lions aren't aren't in there. Oh, well, you never know. There's a big game path coming up ahead. Always a good place to look for tracks. And there are kudu tracks and elephant tracks. Hyena tracks. We've got one more game path to check. Two more actually. There's one here. Uh, buffalo tracks. And uh, last but certainly not least, the most prominent in the area has been blocked by an elephant. Now, animals, you're just going to have to walk elsewhere. <laughs> they can see they've come around it here. Uh, Let's have a look, just make sure no lion tracks there. They're not. Okay, we're going to keep on our search. While we do that, let's go see what Byron's up to. We've got a beautiful red-billed oxpecker sitting on a big buffalo. Oh, look at that. Isn't that cool? Look at that big, thick boss. That's that middle structure of horn on this, on this male buffalo. The males get very thick bosses. I see that hawksbeck is just cleaning its beak on there at the moment. The older these buffalo get, the thicker and bigger the bosses get. And that's obviously so they can def challenge each other for dominance um, when they are wanting to mate with females. But these, these old males often form what we call bachelor herds. Uh, let me just move forward a little bit for you, hang on. Um, and these bachelor herds can be anywhere between, well, one male by himself, but up to about 10 or 15 sometimes. Um, possibly find larger bachelor herds, so these old bulls that move around together. And uh, they actually don't move very far. The reason for that is because they are older, they prefer just finding areas where there's some green grass and good vegetation to feed on and some water and most likely a, a mud wallow or two in the area. And what they would do then is they generally stay within those areas. And one reason for the mud wallow is so that they can bathe or roll in the mud. And the reason for that is it helps protect the skin from insects, especially ticks, like that oxpecker would have been looking for, the ticks on the buffalo. So if there is a big herd of buffalo that moves through, in those large herds, somewhere, you know, they can be up to two or three hundred buffalo moving in an area, especially in this section of Kruger that we are in. I've seen more. I've seen four, five hundred buffalo moving together before in this area. And that's generally a lot of the females, the younger buffalo, or the calves and that with them, and then some young males or some big dominant males that will move with the herd. But those herds will cover huge distances constantly looking for food and water. So that's why these males, these older males, don't like moving around as much with them. So what they do is they move off into an area where they can stay, hang around and wait. And if those herds move past again, these males may occasionally meet up for a, for a short while, see if there are any females that they can mate with, try and challenge some of the other bulls around, and then they'll move off again. So they don't, some people thought that these older bulls get pushed out of the herd. It's not necessarily the case. They usually choose to move off on their own and form these bachelor herds. Occasionally they're called, uh, or the other name rather, not occasionally, but the other name for these buffalo bulls, known as Dugger Boys. Now the Dugger Boys get the name from that wallowing in mud. And Dugger is a, a Zulu word, or the word is actually Umdaga, it originates from Zulu, and the, it's a word for mud. So these buffalo bulls would roll around in the mud constantly so that's where they get the name Dugger Boys from and these are one of the animals that are probably the one of the most unpredictable in the bush if you are walking and you do come across any buffalo you do have to be careful especially the, these old males because they can turn and they can come for you fairly quickly if they feel threatened generally they do decide to move off but again 
they one of the animals that as I say are unpredictable they'll run a little bit turn and they'll come and they'll watch you and one of uh, there was an author that wrote uh, interesting I can't remember his name now but uh, um, many years ago and he wrote and he said uh, he was a big game hunter and he said a buffalo always looks at you like you owe him money and I think that's quite a quite an accurate description of a buffalo they lift their heads up and they look kind of stare down their noses at you and when you get that look you know you you potentially in for some trouble they've just moved off now a lovely view of those two big bulls I was telling Jandre the other day we were driving and I think Dave and I were on the vehicle came around a corner and there was a buffalo bull not too far from us and he just looked and wasn't happy and decided to turn and charge no warning at all turn and charge the vehicle which is very unusual so we quickly had to drive out of there but it was interesting behavior and again it's it just that they're unpredictable that's the biggest thing with buffalo a very very cool warning which is wonderful it's nice to be out in these cool warnings I wouldn't be surprised if some of this cloud cover starts burning off a little bit later it's often what happens out here just want to have a look at something here what You know what this is? Not very clear, unfortunately, but um, I would have liked to have shown you, but these are just little civet tracks walking down the road. Yeah, little civet tracks. I'd be able to see them, but they're not that clear. The are civet tracks. Brian, you wanted to know what age would these buffalo move out of the herd? It's difficult to say, Brian. Um, I would say, you know, if they, generally the average age of a buffalo out in the wild is maybe 15 to 20, the, or the, the age they can live up to, uh, rather. And uh, I would say maybe if these males get to about... 12 to 15 probably decide that it's time to to move out and rest a little bit but yeah the, late, the later years of a buffalo and like I said the average age that they can live to is about between 15 and 20 or 21 some books will say 21 years old um, but I think it depends on the conditions in the area uh, we've got some beautiful antelope over here Go. Saminiala. A beautiful female in Yala. I don't see a male around here just yet. And there's another one. Look at those beautiful white stripes down the body. That one looks a little bit scruffy though. And it's it's not an not actually uncommon to see in Yala looking a bit scruffy and ruffled up. I have seen it before. On many in Yala. They are beautiful antelope, and it's incredible to see how different the males look to the females. Some people think that they're two different species when they first see them because they do look like it. They look completely different in color. These females with the reddish brown coloration, and the males have that beautiful dark gray coat also with the white stripes though and I know Brent was asking this morning and he put out a um, quiz for all of you regarding the antelope falling in the uh, Tregelophus or Tregelophus uh, genus and these Inyala are in that genus so they are related to Kudu and these animals with the spiral horns and the white stripes or white markings on the body
It's so nice to see them. And the bushbuck is another one that we get in this area, also part of that family. And uh, Virginia, you wanted to know, do the antelope stay standing when they give birth? I've never seen an antelope give birth, but from my understanding, they do. They do stay standing. They'll try and stand, spread their hindquarters, and give birth that way so that the lamb can drop down. And also with that little thud, it helps just kickstart all the um, the vital organs and that. Occasionally, with the, um, if I look back at giraffe, and uh, when giraffe give birth, there's a long drop for that little, uh, little foal when it's born. Um, and... Uh, and what happens is, as it drops and hits the ground, it helps just kickstart the heart, make sure it's breathing properly, and also uh, it, um, it uh, mainly the breathing rather than the heart, but also to snap the umbilical cord. So as it drops, that snaps. And I think it's similar with these antelope, and from what I've heard, like I said, I've never seen an antelope give birth though, but they do give birth standing up, so that the, the lamb or, or calf can drop out and maybe snap that umbilical cord and also help kickstart the breathing a bit. And hopefully also to try and remove some of that placenta that would be around the, the antelope. Those in Yala seem to have moved off. And we're going to do the same now. Let's see what else we can find and let's head over to Steph on Bushwalk and see what he's got. We found a very interesting sign to show you today and it's these two parallel scrapes. Oh, we just got Xander stuck, there we go. We are coming to you live from the bush and Xander does have a backpack on with a big aerial getting him hung up in branches every now and again. We come and have a look at these two very clear scrapes, parallel scrapes. You got one here and there's one here. And in the scrape, you can see that there's some dried fluid. It looks like it's been raining on the top of this scrape. Now, what this is, is very interesting. It's these scrapings from a bull rhinoceros. It's the territorial marking for a bull rhinoceros. And basically what he did was he came walking through the bush. He saw this, he saw this little tree here, and then he started to scrape his feet like this. And while he was scraping his feet, he was urinating from between his legs. But they got this like hose pipe like urine. It comes out like a fire hydrant basically. It's the most intense thing. Probably flattened a bit of this bush. So this rhinoceros came walking like this, scraping the, the, the sand and spraying out behind him. And he sprayed out onto the sand. And that's what we're seeing. He was walking in this direction. And the reason why I know that is because here's all the scraped up grass and leave from his scrapings of his feet. So he was going in this direction. But what's interesting about this is also the fact that if you rub a piece of bark or a stick into this urine and you smell it, It is the most pungent smell. It is the, it's, it's quite difficult to, to, to explain, but I'm gonna try it. It sort of tickles the inside of your nose right in the beginning, and then whacks you at the back of your throat with this um, mustiness, I would, I would say. This sort of spicy mustiness, a peppery, spicy mustiness. And that's what rhinoceros urine smells like. Why it's still here after all this time is quite an interesting story as well. And the fact that animals that use um, their urine and other various types of glands to mark their territory have elements in this urine and elements in these glandular secretions that keep that smell there for a long time. Obviously my sense of smell is very poor in comparison to a rhinoceros's um, and many other animals that use it as well. But I can still smell this probably days after it was deposited here and um, it's interesting in that humans have now evolved a way to utilize this stickiness of smell uh, ambergris is a very very well was uh, a very common use for the lining of a sperm whale's stomach is this incredibly pungent uh, substance called ambergris and that used to be harvested from sperm whales when they were hunted uh, years ago hopefully more than a century ago for this ambergris and um, 
diluted down to form the base, the stickiness in perfumes, and that was one of the one of the most common of the of the uses for this uh, animal exuvate, I suppose, was this stickiness diluted down. While quite pungent in its normal natural form, diluted down forms the stickiness that we find in perfumes. On a more local scale, you find things like civet, where we get our civet from, the African civet. Their anal gland has a secretion that is incredibly pungent and sticky, and that diluted down formed the base of perfumes, and in some areas still forms the base of perfumes. That earth note or the undertone, that 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 that. that, that perfume note that carries with you for the rest of the day. It's made of these things. Nowadays, of course, it's all uh, copied and I suppose synthesized chemical variants of these types of things. But um, isn't that incredible, eh? Oh, it is the most amazing thing. I wouldn't call it unpleasant, but it definitely is very, very, uh, it, it stays with you a bit. Now James, you've asked me what is the easiest way to tell the sex of a rhino. Um, it's actually a good question James and it's a good question because it's not immediately apparent on the external features of a rhino uh, what the sex is. They both have the same amount of horns. Um, they are different subtly though. Obviously the male rhino when compared to a female rhino is much smaller. So female rhinoceros are much smaller than the male compatriots and generally females always are attended by youngsters. So they have quite a good birth rate. So males are solitary, females are attended by youngsters. So if you're looking at them through the bush, that'll be a telltale sign. Um, other external features is that the female from behind has got a, a, a spread pelvis um, and her... her uh, private parts for lack of a better word are much e easier visible than a male's who's got quite a, a um, compacted bottom um, you can't really see a penal sheath on a, on a rhinoceros they keep everything inside it's an internal thing with a little bit of skin on the outside that's about it um, and then obviously a male rhinoceros does what we've just examined here on the floor he will walk and mark his territory quite vigorously other than that James you know there's not much to tell a female rhino from a male rhino it's just relatively I suppose the easiest one is is their relative general impression of size and shape relative to one another that's about the easiest way to tell the sexes of a rhino from from far away you know without getting too close let's take a walk oh before we go Anna wants to know how old is this rhino marking well, and I, um, I would say that judging from the fact that this grass has already stood up here, this is bone dry, the, the actual urine mark is bone dry, and the grasses that he did kick up here have already dried up, you can see there, have already dried compared to this grass here. I would say that this is a couple of days old, probably Judging about the wind that we had here, I would say that this was probably done on Friday or Saturday last week that this was laid down here. That would be my guess. All right, so what we're going to do now is uh, send you over to one of the others and see what they're up to. <laughs> and we've got some more Nyala and an Impala at the back there, but there is a beautiful big male Nyala. There he is. Uh, now you can see the difference between the male. There's another youngster. You can see the color variation now nicely with that m young male at the back and this adult male in front. You see how the youngsters, the young males, they will, when they are born and when they are young, are the same color as the females. And the older they get, they start to change color. And you get these beautiful gray antelope um, as a big male. You see he's doing a bit of horn thrashing there. That's just territorial displays that the male antelope do occasionally. Isn't he magnificent? Beautiful, beautiful big male. Just to see these different antelope in the same area, to see impala with some of the inyala. But look at those white markings on the face. Look <laughs> how they lift their legs when they walk. And 
and it generally browses but I think at the moment there's so many green little shoots coming out that they are um, gra not quite grazing there's probably little plants in that that they are feeding on there and they may be feeding on some of the grass but I think it's little flowers and little plants that they can find on the ground that they are feeding on so that would technically still make them a, gra a browser as opposed to a grazer grazer only feeds on grass and y'all tend to feed off leaves of plants I can't see what it looks like I don't know don't know what he's got there but he's enjoying it that's for sure very very peaceful at the moment there's a lilac breasted roller sitting somewhere around here I can just hear it the harsh call of the roller oh you've got some dwarf mongoose there oh look at that ah, all spotted genre isn't that wonderful everyone you see what happens when you're just patient sit around and spend some time with animals things start happening around you Look at that, so cute, a little dwarf mongoose. <laughs> now they're very gregarious, which means they do live in large family groups or large groups. And they're probably, that was probably their home inside that little sandy section. Most likely some little burrows and look at them. Oh, they are wonderful little creatures, the dwarf mongoose, smallest mongoose species we get here. Oh, there's a young one. Look at that. We do have many other mongoose species around here too. We also get the banded mongoose, which is also very gregarious. And uh, some of these groups, these family groups, you can have uh, or anywhere between, um, I'm trying to think now, anywhere between 15 and 30 or 40 of them sometimes in some of the large banded mongoose uh, families. And the dwarf mongoose, maybe between 15 and 20 or so in large groups. And then we also have the slender mongoose, the yellow mongoose, those are solitary, we do see them around occasionally. We also have white-tailed mongoose, the nocturnal mongoose which is the largest species we get in the area but those you generally see at night it's funny you just get a flash of mongoose running through the back <laughs> occasionally you see that you know, oh, they, between those two antelope and if they, if they go this is really lovely. Anthony, you said those mongoose are so fast. They are incredibly fast. They have to be. These little creatures need to rely on their speed and agility to evade uh, um, predators. I just saw a cuckoo flying everybody I'm trying to see if it's going to sit and I think it was a great spotted cuckoo I can hear it I wonder if it's still flying around it's just moved ahead of us why don't we see let's uh, leave the Zinyala and dwarf mongoose to continue feeding Let's see if we can find that cuckoo. It's just up ahead. I can hear it calling. That would be a nice bird to see. I think 
I see it. I think I see it. Up at the top of that tree. Is that not it sitting there? It is indeed great spotted cuckoo. Right at the top of the tree. There we go. Ah, nice surprise. I heard you calling and saw it just fly through or fly past us while we were sitting with those in Yala. That's a lovely bird to add to your list. Any birders who are watching? Listen to it calling. It's a beautiful, beautiful bird. And it's great to see these cuckoos. So these cuckoos obviously all migrate um, and they come back for the summer. And it's wonderful to see them because they are very secretive birds and you don't often see them. And so you hear them a lot. They've all got beautiful calls and you can easily identify them by their different calls. But, uh, but you don't always see them. And there it goes. Wonderful, isn't that a nice surprise? All right, we're gonna continue on our drive and see what else we can find. Let's head over to Brent, who's got some wildebeest. Well, unfortunately, our tracking of the Incahumas has led us to some wildebeest. They've crossed into Buffalo's Hook, but apparently the tracks might be coming back towards Juma again. I'm gonna go have a look a little bit further, but I thought we would enjoy a nice herd of wildebeest. Some of those females are looking quite pregnant. So I think it's gonna be probably a week or so before we see the first baby wildebeest. Now, of course, Viem's nickname is the wildebeest. And is that, why is that Viem? Because of these things. Because of those things, yes. Uh, uh, what Veer meant to say, it's because he filmed the first ever live birth of a wildebeest uh, last last year or the year before. Safari live. Safari live first. Not the, Not the very first, yes, Veer. Veer being very particular, as he is. Snorting. What are you snorting at, Phil? Are you snorting at us or are you snorting at something else? Or are you just snorting to get the botfly larvae out of your nostrils? So there is a specific species of botfly that does uh, live inside wildebeest nostrils or sinuses. And that's why they do snort quite often. Such a strange looking antelope, the wildly beast. Sometimes referred to as the clowns of the bushveld. Yes, you, you're a clown. Certainly look like one. So even though they look like a little bit like buffalo or cattle, they are not. They are an antelope. They're a very fussy eater. And they like the short grasses. And they'll move vast distance as as you know from the Serengeti Mara migration to find those grasses. They do have local migrations here in South Africa, but nothing quite to the extent. Also referred to as the brindled gnu. Gnu from the sound it makes when they're chatting to each other. They go gnu, 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 gnu. Uh, and the brindling you can see on the neck the sort of darker and lighter colorations and the one in the middle is the bull the dominant bull from this area you can see his horns are slightly bigger and more developed and there's a yearling having himself a scratch so that was a baby last year he's done well to survive Hello, ladybugs and daisies. Uh, ladybugs and daisies, what a wonderful name. Is wondering 
have we seen Gnormless Gnormen the GNU recently? We did, unfortunately we were having some tech difficulties, but Gnormless is still dominating the southern plains of Cheetah Plains, keeping Normal Norman his northern arch rival at bay. Let's leave the wildebeests and uh, go see if the Inkahumas have crossed back towards us. Kristen says, uh, thank you, Vim. The first day ever watching Safari Live was the 20th of November 2014, and there were two wildebeests filmed being born at that day. Uh, did you film both, Vim, or? Um, Brian filmed the other one. Brian filmed the other one. How then did you become the wildebeest and Brian just stayed as Brian? He got eaten. Oh, yes, Brian got eaten, or Brian's mom got eaten. Well, everyone gets eaten eventually out here. But for those of you who might be new, so there was a wildebeest with a very deformed horn that gave birth to a young wildebeest uh, that uh, everyone named Brian, after Brian Joubert, the thumb. And uh, of course, because the female was so noticeable and she had a very distinct deformity on her horn, she became known as Brian's mother or Brian's mom. Firstly, Brian got eaten, I think quite soon after he was born. Hey, Vim, I wasn't here yet. Yes, a, a day. No, like a week or two. A week or two after he was born, Brian got eaten. Poor Brian. And then, uh, when was it? Probably middle of Lono, early last year, Brian's mother got eaten. Uh, we actually, I don't know where I put them, but we did have Brian's mom's horns somewhere. Must be on top of the carports, I think. Okay, now, the Kahumas apparently crossed around here and might be turning back. Well, Anna Marie has asked a very interesting question. Why do you see wildebeest walking in circles? Well, Anna Marie, it depends on what type of circle. If they're walking a very tight circle and constantly doing that, that's a botfly inf infestation that's uh, severed their optic nerve. Uh, Mostly, I would say, when wildebeest are walking tight circles, it's almost always going to be a bot fly problem. But in big circles, I'm, I'm not sure. They are known as the clowns of the bush felt, Marie. Oh, dear. Popped my earpiece out. Let me just put that back in. Apparently the wildebeest, I mean the wildebeest, ha, <laughs> the Inkahumas, last tracks, were heading east along here towards a large Inkaya tree, which is a large knobthorn tree. So we're just checking slowly. Well, there's Rex in. Let's see if he's got an update for us. This morning. Yeah, I think they're still inside Bufflesook. Okay, well, good luck. <laughs> uh, hi, Bree. Uh, Bree is wondering why are the lions not eating wildebeest and zebra and impala and stuff and keep eating buffalo? Well, the buffalo have been hit very hard by the drought, which makes them very easy to catch. Uh, and that's why they've been focusing on the buffalo. Now, we're pretty sure it doesn't look like they've come back out, so they're still in Bufflesook. They're quite close to the boundary. Nice cool day like today. Fingers crossed they come back uh, sometime during the day. Now we're going to start meandering down towards uh, quarantine, see if we can find that baby impala we saw yesterday, or maybe find two baby impala. Hopefully <laughs> that baby impala has made it through the night and uh, no uh, predator has caught it. Now we're going to flee wheel down the hill. Well, there's
as some of you new viewers were pondering, are we really live? By you, I'm talking to you. Of course we're live, and by you, please send us questions. And if you're not sure, oh, you've sent us a question, but the best way to get a question, because I know, I think you're watching on YouTube, is to use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or send us an email, uh, questions at wildearth.tv, and by you, we will do our best uh, to answer them for you. Okay, so we are now heading back down towards Juma itself. Oh, I can hear people talking on the game drive radio, which I turn down. Let's listen. Oh, that's very loud. Let's turn it down again. Let's carry on. What else is out here? I don't know. Uh, as I said, we have been issued with flood warnings for this area starting on well, Thursday or Friday throughout the weekend. Apparently on Saturday itself, uh, not far, Hutzbreit, not far from here, is a predicted to get 120 millimeters. That is an inexorbitant amount of rain. Oh. And uh, that would be flood weather. As I said, we might be swimming around Juma if that happens. And if it does happen, let's hope it's a long soaking rain and not a deluge in an hour you know, that'll wash away all the topsoil. Now, with a downpour expected for the weekend, Ryan's wondering, is there any particular wildlife we're only going to see during the downpour? Uh, well, uh, during and maybe just after, a lot of different frog species, uh, and uh, it, quite occasionally, uh, especially after a big downpour, if the sun comes out, or even if it doesn't, uh, a lot of, uh, not a lot, but you've got a good chance of seeing certain snake species. So, especially the burrowing snakes, what happens is they're, they're, their home get flooded and they have to pop out uh, and onto the surface so during rain you can see quite a few snakes and what else who knows maybe the deluge is going to flush our first porcupine out of a hole <laughs> we'll have to wait and see as I said I will only tell you it's raining when it's raining I, I'm not sure uh, the weather is a fickle mistress and every time you try a predictor she generally proves you wrong Another thing that might get flushed out of their holes during the rain is a stinging eight-legged creature, but we don't need them to be flushed out because we've got Stefan on foot who can find them all by himself. for signs of their youngsters. So here's the scorpion here, underneath. Now scorpions, even though they have been on the face of the planet for some 300 million years or so, have still, or have evolved, parental care. Isn't that an interesting fact? So this particular scorpion here, so uncover her there, She'll wait in an area for her baby's young, her young to hatch from eggs. They then climb onto her back and they piggyback a ride with her. She helps feed them until they have molted five times. And then from there, they go off on their own. Isn't that an exciting fact? So scorpions are very, make very good moms at least for the youngsters. This here is one of the more common of the venomous scorpions that we find in this particular area. The olive thick-tailed scorpion. You can see that olive color of the legs there and there. That's the pincers. There's the legs down the side of the body. 
you can see that olive color. Now, although these things look quite small, I mean, they generally are, I'm gonna put my finger nearby. They can sting incredibly quick. So I'm not gonna put my finger too close, but there you can see a size comparison. That's my forefinger. This is this particular species of scorpion is responsible for the most stings in the area. And it's because they frequent pieces of wood that people in the area use for firewood. And so when you pick them up quite often, your finger brushes them and they can sting you on your finger repeatedly. It is intensely painful. Um, it's not really that dangerous to adults, young kids, I suppose, or um, heart condition, some, something like that can have a negative reaction to this particular venom. And then of course, anyone who's allergic to bee stings needs to watch out for anaphylactic shock um, that can result from being stung by a scorpion, which can have a whole variety of different uh, side effects. And of course, what you want to try and do is monitor these things incredibly carefully. Now I want to see if I can show you if this is a female or a male. How you tell, apart from the fact that if the female had babies on her back, of course, is by the pincers. Males tend to have longer pincers. There you go. Look at that. Immediately on the defensive. And have a look at that long pincer. I would say that this is a male olive thick-tailed scorpion. Isn't that just amazing? The bright color comes from the fact that I think that the scorpion has probably just shed its skin. When their skin, they, are, they have an exoskeleton made of a, a substance chitin, and chitin doesn't expand. Chitin is inside. The scorpion gets those parts of the chitin to con old, uh, skin and um, they have a new skin and when they skin come, they come out to these most gorgeous colors and their colors are nice and vibrant and clear oh she is a beauty or oh, he is a beauty I should say now you can see the thickness of the tail relative to the robustness of the pincers is what makes this identifiable as a scorpion you should watch out for so when you're looking at scorpions if you ever have the pleasure of seeing scorpions again what you need to do is look at the relative thickness and and design of the tail compared to the pincers on the same scorpion you can quite clearly see that this tail is very well developed quite a muscular looking tail almost and the pincers are quite fine and delicate if it were the other way around, if the pincers were quite robustly designed and quite muscular looking and the tail was long and skinny, then you'd know that that scorpion was probably not that venomous, that it used its pincers rather than using its venom. This scorpion obviously uses its venom to subdue its prey rather than overpowering it with the pincers very very nice all right brent has got a woodland kingfisher to show you and before it flies away off you go here we go another woodlands they're starting to call quite prolifically i've seen about seven or there we go <laughs> on cue good boy and said that we're starting to hear them calling quite prolifically so really really awesome to have them back And off we go. Oh, no, there's another one. Well spotted, VM. Can't really make, or you can see the blue, but it isn't quite that electric blue that we see when uh, they are in shining sunlight. So hopefully that'll be happening quite shortly. Now we've come down to the area where we saw the first baby impala yesterday. No sign of baby impala just yet but we shall be searching and uh, we'll try catch up with one of those big herds from quarantine so let's have a look oh hello ali in new york 
Now, Ali would like to know, do any of the animals follow a birthing season? Uh, yes, a few of them. A lot of animals will give birth throughout the year with peaks depending. Now, the impala, wildebeest, and zebra will are very seasonal uh, breeders. So from normally around the 10th or 15th of November, it's a little bit late this year, through to January, they will give birth. So we've seen the first baby impala yesterday. I'm looking for it right now. Oh, naughty elephants. <coughs> and uh, we are hoping that we're going to see quite a few more. And um, baby impala are awesome. They're very playful. But uh, I think wildebeest, I'd say in the next 10 days or so, we should see the first baby wildebeest uh, and the first baby pigs, the baby warthogs. Uh, they are the cutest. I think that's one of the things I look forward to the most uh, with uh, the coming of the rainy season. Oh, there's, them in, there's some, a herd of impala. Let's get a bit closer. Could this be the herd that is sporting the youngster or maybe more than one youngster overnight? Now, there's a bit of an old wives' tale that impalas can hold out their birthing for the rain. Uh, and uh, it was uh, uh, often said, but it's been turned out to be complete and utter tripe. So they, they, they give birth when they're due to give birth. They can't stop the development of a, of a fetus to wait for decent rains. So I know that, that, that's one of those old wives' tales that's done its round in, in the safari industry for many, many years. Okay, well, we're going to keep checking these impala herds. It doesn't look like there are any babies here. So while we do that, let's go back to Byron, who's got another birdie. And what a beautiful bird it is, a lilac breasted roller, and I'm so glad Brent got to see another woodland kingfisher. Oh, and I can hear a red crested coron calling too. We'll see if we can find that shortly. But look at the beautiful colors on this lilac breasted roller. And I know a lot of viewers and guests of mine that I've had in the past, this is one of their favorite, favorite birds. I love seeing it. Oh, beautiful. I reckon there's about seven different colors on the bird, and let's see what we can count. There's the, the white, that lilac. Uh, let's quickly head to Brent. He's got something interesting there, quickly. Look at this, it's a black mamba. I know lots of people have been wondering about snakes. It's a big black mamba that's being attacked by starlings. And I just saw the starlings acting strangely. So I stopped to have a look. I said, Viam, I'm sure there's a snake there. We just saw that mamba rear its head. It's quite a big one. And you can see that coffin shaped head of the black mamba. Now the snakes are gonna start getting moving at the moment. Oh, isn't this awesome? Out, right out in the open. You can see the starlings there, very unimpressed to have a mamba in the area. They might have a nest close by. And they were dive bombing it. They might try dive bobbing again. Look at that. Okay, I'm just Oh, in comes the starling. I'm just going to move a bit forward. Well, cat in Tampa, you were asking for snakes this morning. There we go. A nice big black mamba, probably around two meters, maybe even a bit bigger. And just seeing where it's going. Don't want to get too close, don't want to scare it. Is it going down a hole there, Vim? Or is that a stick? No, that's indeed the snake. I'm trying to see if it's going down a hole. Or it's just... No, it's not. It's coming out the other side. No, it could be hunting for frogs, mice, baby birds. And you can just see those starlings are really upset with its presence. 
Do I need to move him? Yeah. Okay. If we're lucky, we might see it climb a tree. I've lost sight of it. Have you? Still got it, fam? Well, let's watch the starlings. They tell us where it is. There you go. It's going to climb the tree. It might go into a hole in the tree. Or it might climb the tree. This is spectacular. This is one of the, the best snake sight. What's the best snake sighting of the wet season so far? Now you see a very square shaped head. Uh, as people say, it looks like a bit like a coffin, and uh, that's why you've got to be careful around them. Now, of course, you can see the black mamba is indeed not black at all, but more of a gunmetal grey. Now, the black part comes from the inside of its mouth. It has a black inside of the mouth. Now, black is always a colour of danger in the bush, because a lot of animals can only see in black and white. Okay, let's move again. Let's try it around. Just wondering if it's going to go into a, a crevice in the tree, or is it going to... Oh, there's other birds joining in the mumba beating. Let's just try see what's going on here. Is that it there? Am I seeing things again? Just right to the, just to the left of the base of the tree there. A little bit more to the left. A little bit more. Nah, it's a stick. Now, Easy, who's a new viewer, is wondering, do snakes drink water? Indeed, they do. They do drink water. I think this mamba might have gone into a hole. Let's just try it. But as I said, we don't want to get too close. We don't want to scare it away. Vim thinks he can see it. Back. There we go. No, we've still got it. We've still got it. That's the tip of the tail. Now you always got to worry where's the head? Now, of course, they have incredibly powerful neurotoxic venom. You see those starlings mocking it? Now it all depends on how big you are, how dangerous a black mamba is. Of course they are very, very... Oh, look at that! Now the snake's in there somewhere. Now if these birds sense an opportunity where they can pick the snake without being bitten, they will do it. Where's he gone? Or she gone? Well, oh, thank you very much, James Richards. James Richards says, Wow, Brent, you've got all the firsts of the season so far. Impala lamb, woodlands kingfisher, and now a black mamba. Okay, let's have a look. Oof! so upset. I'm just trying to see if I can pick up any movement. I'd say just judging from how agitated the, the starlings are, they're still, the snake's still just below them somewhere. Let's see the one there, oh, somewhere there. Okay, let's try and move a little bit again. Might be just taking refuge from the bombardment in that little bit of brush we've got there. And we could have gone down a hole. Let's just have a quick closer look. I think he's gone down a hole. What do you think, Vim? Uh, we just gotta be careful. Mumba is also the fastest moving snake. Fortunately for us, a vehicle is faster. 
Nope. I think he's gone down a hole. Or she's gone down a hole. Wow, wasn't that wonderful? Now, black mambas, as scary as they are, I'm going to tell you a very funny story uh, that happened to a, a very, very good friend of mine and who used to work with me in the bush and uh, his tracker. So they were on a game drive with lots of guests and off they go. We're on game drive. We're going looking for lions and leopards. la di da di da And often when you're talking, you're not really watching, you're sort of watching the road sort of out of the corner of your eye and you're talking to your guests. You've got your tracker sitting up front there to spot things. And uh, I'm not going to mention his name, uh, just we'll keep him anonymous now. My anonymous friend and my, his anonymous tracker, uh, as they were driving down the road like this, his tracker said, Stop, 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 so he stopped and he turned off the car. And uh, his tracker leapt off the, uh, the front of the tracker seat and was gone into the bush. And uh, he had managed to park on the end of a black mumba's tail, a very big one, about three meters. And where we worked, there were no doors. And this mumba was lashing around and basically came into his footwell. So he leapt out of the car as well and now there was a big discussion between him and his tracker on how to move the car off the mumba's tail so it could get away so eventually they got all the guests off the car made them sit over there and they took um, uh, two sticks one long stick from there to push on the clutch and another one to put the vehicle into neutral uh, and it didn't roll it didn't move so then they went to the back of the car and they pushed it and the mumba uh, happily for the mumba made a safe escape and so did my anonymous friend uh, his anonymous tracker and uh and the rest of the guests. Now, of course, uh, a lot of you might think I'm telling that story because it was me. I, if it was me, I would admit to it, I promise. But uh, without my friend's permission to embarrass him in front of thousands, I, I think I won't. Okay, now, so from, while well, we continue to search for the lo for first and second and third baby impala of the year, or of the season, rather, uh, Steph has got some wonderful little insects to show you. First, I just have to say what a fantastic sighting that was. It's not every day that we get to see black mambas out here, one of Africa's most feared snakes. I must say, it's something that we keep our eyes open for here on the bushwalk, uh, like nothing else. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, it, we've just come upon an example of, of one of Mother Nature's most wonderful, you know, examples of her, of her, of her complexity. And it's in this branch. Here we have a gall. This gall was formed by either the gall wasp or a gall midge. And what, it, what the wasp does, if it was the wasp, is sting the tree with her ovipositor and inject a growth hormone along with her egg. The tree then develops this gall and the egg then hatches into the wasp's larva, which then eats the inside of the gall out and then pupates, chews its way out through that little hole that you see over there and emerges as a full-grown wasp but that leaves all these galls all over the place and ants love to populate these trees the tree itself is host to a variety of different insects all that are preyed upon by the species of ant that is living inside and I'm going to try and elicit a response by gently tapping on this particular gall see if I can blow in there and see if one emerges but there's a entire family of cocktail ants there one just came out did you see him come out yeah one came down now they don't like it when the their tree is disturbed and so what's happening is in response to me blowing on this they're probably sending out a few soldiers to say hey man what's going on a tree in return for its sap that attracts insects which then feed the ants gets protected from any pests these ants will not tolerate sap sucking insects and will mob the sap sucking insect off of the tree thus providing the tree with some protection but isn't that already such an amazingly complex story you got the gall wasp using the wood of the tree as a host for its for its parasitic at the time uh, 
wasp larvae, the parasitic wasp larvae leaves, leaving along this home, which is then in turn inhabited by the cocktail ant, which then protects the tree from pests living on, living on it. And in return for providing the ant with some food in the form of those pests and other insects that are attracted to the tree's sap and to the tree's flowers. Isn't that amazing? The gall on the Terminalia sericea. This is a Terminalia sericea tree, a silver cluster leaf. Now Liz, you've asked me what started my interest in ants and do I have the same interest in termites? Um, yes, I actually have the same interest in termites. I just find ants a little bit more interesting than I do termites this year. Every single year I chair Liz, we have a different thing here that that grabs my attention this particular year just seems to be ants there's just such a huge variety they're so socially uh, uh, evolved and complex it's just quite interesting to see them termites held my interest and fascination a couple of seasons ago and um, they nonetheless just as interesting to be honest with you but to me for sure ants this year ants bees and wasps this year all from the order of hymenoptera have captured captured my interest now it's come to that part of the day where unfortunately i have to say goodbye to you we are on our way to breakfast so i just want to say on behalf of myself and xander and herbert i just want to say thank you for uh, for joining us on this morning's bushwalk i will catch you again on the bushwalk this afternoon or tomorrow morning at some point in the next couple days you'll be seeing me again anyway wherever you are in the world have a good day we'll catch up to you later you're off to Byron we've got a beautiful little antelope trying to hide away from us I'm gonna move forward a little bit it is a tiny steenbok a little steenbok a male and he's been very relaxed he's been hanging around with us for a while Let's see if we can get another view of him. Oh dear, there he runs. Now he's decided he's had enough of us. Hang on, he may stop again. Very, very fast little antelope. And look at that. They are beautiful. And it's nice that he's out and open. Smallest antelope that we have here at the, at the moment or in this area. And what's between this and the little Dacre? I suppose and the little clip springer um, but I'm not sure and I wonder if you've ever seen a clip springer on Safari Live Jandre do you know if you've no, yeah there are no rocky outcrops they prefer rocky areas uh, so that's probably why that's why I don't think you have seen one in this area but we do get them in the Sabi sands called a clip springer or it means rock jumper oh what startled that little steenbok gone uh, stopped again maybe it just heard something got a little fright but just shows you how quick and agile they are if they have to they'll run very very quickly to get away from any harm or danger You could see those little horns clearly on the male. The females do not have horns. So it's easy to, to tell the difference between the two. <laughs> oh, that was nice. A nice little surprise and lovely view of the Stenbock. Often they do run away quite quickly. They are very shy. But that little one ended up spending quite some time with us, which is great. Oh, is that a bit of drizzle, I feel, almost. I felt one or two little drops. Maybe I'm imagining things. Oh, plum-colored starlings. Look, look at that. Beautiful plum colored starling. Oh, they just that one flew off, but there's still one or two around here. Yeah, there are three of them. Let's just see where they've gone now. Bruce, you wanted to know with the rain and that around, do some of the animals then have to con move around and do their scent marking again? They are there, you got them there. There we go. 
Look at that. Look at those plum colored starlings. Wonderful. Look at that beautiful color. Bruce, uh, just getting back to your question. Yes, uh, the animals like lions and leopards would go and probably do a lot more scent marking after rains because it does wash away some of their scent. Look at that. Oh, this is great because I haven't seen these for quite some time. Another one's coming back there. There it is. Three of them. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful little bird. I just want to read you quickly in terms of their, their migration, just to give you an idea. And um, I've got a little bird app, and these bird apps really are, are fantastic because they've got so much information. But I do find, um, obviously, it's more important to have a book. Um, but these little apps, if you have a look, um, you can scan. They give you the distribution. Um, and when they are migrate, when they arrive, what months they are around for. But because um, these, I think, um, so it says, you know, they, they common breeding migrants, so uh, to southern Africa, and they're present from October through to April. So that's exactly where we are at the moment. So they've, but uh, these little apps will often tell you where they might great too. Um, so they basically just migrate to northern Africa um, or sub-Saharan Africa up to Senegal, Somalia and then come back through um, back through down to southern Africa for the um, for the but look at the coloration of those birds so for the summer for our summer months I'll come back down that was a lovely surprise nice little bird for those birders out there who want to improve on your bird list so that was really really great nice little sighting well we've had a wonderful morning i hope you've all enjoyed it with us too uh, nice to see some elephants again those big bulls that we saw earlier we'll see you again this afternoon on drive i'll probably be on a vehicle again and uh, from myself and jandre thank you very much for being on camera goodbye and we'll head back to brent and see what he's got before the end of the show goodbye everyone well, we've been searching through those impala herds. Uh, alas, no sign of any new babies. Now, it is fascinating that we got to see that black mamba uh, and with its cyto, oh, sorry, neurotoxic venom. And uh, of course, I told you about the inside of its mouth. Is how it gets its name. Marco, Marco is wondering how big can a mamba get? The biggest mamba I have ever seen, and it was an expired one, uh, was 4.4 meters. Now, 4.4 meters. Let's go. Let's do it next to the vehicle here. Um, actually, let's go from here. How, can you see my feet, fam? Okay. Yeah. So there we go. That's the tail. That's the head. That's the biggest mamba I've ever seen, Marco. 4.4 meters. There are reports of some being over five meters. Oopsie, now I'm just gonna show you the inside of its, its, its mouth. There we go, the black mamba. Let's see, there should be a nice I image of the inside of a mamba mouth. So there we go, there's that black, oopsie, that black coloration of other black mamba. Okay, so you can see quite dark. Now they're front fanged snakes. Sorry, I was trying to find my ears. Oh dear, making a mess, there we go. So I'm just trying to, there we go. So they're front fanged snakes. Uh, as to how old they, they live, oh, I'm not 100% sure, Mark. I'll, I'll double check quickly. But while I'm doing that, I'll just chat a little bit about their, their, their 
their teeth. So their teeth, they're front fang snake or new world snake, and basically, which means that their venom glands or venom sacs up, um, which are up behind their head there, have got in the muscles around there. So they're able to control the amount of venom they inject, uh, depending on the size of this the prey or whether they're defending themselves so also which makes them very different from old world snakes is that the inside of their what inside of their their teeth is hollowed so basically their teeth are very very sharp little hypodermic needles and the fact that they can control the amount of venom that they push in is one of the other reasons that they are quite dangerous but uh, Marco I'm afraid I'm, just, I'm not sure I'm gonna have to find out for you but uh, they normally uh, snakes like that are normally quite long-lived I'm not exactly how sure how long I'm gonna have to go research that for you Marco and uh, but it has been wonderful what a great great morning and it's always great when you set out to go track some male lions and you find them and then everything else on top of that's been a bonus woodlands kingfishers and of course that wonderful black mamba sighting so from myself and vm and everyone here at safari live it's been absolutely splendid having you with us and we will see you shortly for the sunset safari hopefully those lions are still around maybe the inkahum has come back uh, but it's live so you never know what's going to happen see you soon